So welcome everyone. This, is, this workshop is titled Collaboration, the Future of California Water Management. This will be the first in this year's series of workshops on science and policy hosted by our organization, the South Yuba River Citizens League, affectionately known as CIRCLE. My name is Keiko Mertz and I'm the policy manager here at CIRCLE. We are joined today by Tim Quinn and Brian Graber. Before I move to, um, to formally introduce the speakers, I have a few details to share. Both speakers will give short presentations and then we'll open it up for question and answer. We're thrilled to have you participate and ask thought-provoking questions, but we do ask you hold your questions until the end. For logistical reason, reasons, we can only accept questions through the chat feature today. You will be muted with video off throughout the presentation. This is being recorded and is presented as part of the 20th anniversary of the Wild and Scenic Film Festival's Activist Center, sponsored by Earth Justice. We had originally planned to host this workshop in person, but once again, circumstances forced us to make the difficult decision to go virtual. We're so glad you're here and wanna give a big thank you to our presenters for their quick pivot to virtual. Now to introduce the speakers. Tim Quinn retired in 2018 after an eventful career in California water management. One second. Um, water management and politics. His water career began in 1978 when he studied groundwater management for his PhD in economics at UCLA. Tim then served a 22 year stint at the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, most of it as deputy general manager. In 2017, Tim became the executive director of the Association of California Water Agencies. In 2019, Tim was the William C. Landreth Visiting Fellow at Stanford University's Water in the West program, where he taught a course on water policy and wrote a paper on governance based on his career experience. Most recently, the Stanford paper is being used to structure the San Joaquin Valley Collaborative Action Program, also known as CAP, which Tim will tell you more about today. Tim and his wife, Vivian, have four grown children and seven grandchildren. In retirement, Tim's life revolves around the three Gs, grandkids and family, golf, and governance. Brian Graber is the Senior Director for River Restoration at American Rivers, which is an organization dedicated to keeping rivers healthy and free while ensuring people have the water they need. Brian leads American Rivers River Restoration Team to remove dams and restore floodplains around the country. Brian is a trained fluvial geomorphologist and water resources engineer, and he specializes in river habitat restoration and in developing restoration programs. Prior to working at American Rivers, he worked for Massachusetts Riverways Program as a river restoration scientist. There, he helped guide the development of the state's river restoration priority project program. He also previously coordinated Trout Unlimited Small Dams Program, which worked to remove obsolete dams that do more harm than good. Lastly, Brian has also run his own consulting business, designing dam removal, channel restoration, completing watershed assessments, and more. We are so excited to have them here to share their perspectives on collaboration in California water management. Um, and at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim to give his presentation. Thank you, Kiko. Let me pull up a PowerPoint. It's how I keep myself on track. Um, thanks. I am really pleased to be here. I uh, was not intimately familiar with Circle before I was contacted by Kiko a couple of months ago, but I really like what I've learned about this organization and am growing to respect it by the day. Uh, Kiko was a student of mine at UC Davis uh, three years ago. And uh, she, when she was putting together a program on governance, she remembered a series of lectures that I gave at, the, at UC Davis. And she asked me to do repeat some of that stuff. And she actually remembered what I said and it had made an impression on her. So I was hugely uh, flattered by all of that. So that's what I'm gonna do today is uh, talk a little bit about my experience at Stanford. Now, if, you're, if your screen's like mine, you can't see all of my slides. I'm just gonna leave it up to you to uh, use your imagination on what's on the right two and a half inches of, 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 your, uh, of your monitor. Uh, this, this, the, um, this presentation is entitled 40 Years of California Water Policy, What Worked, What Didn't, and Lessons for the Future. That is the um, uh, title of a paper that I wrote at uh, Stanford as the William C. Uh, this is, uh, we already went through this stuff. I do want to emphasize 
I think I've learned a lot about governance and I learned it in the school of hard knocks on the ground, trying to put together policies, get agreements on legislation, uh, do controversial projects. So uh, I, I, I've never studied governance formally, but I have learned a lot in the course of a 40 plus year career. When I was at Stanford, I wrote this paper, you'll recognize the title because I, I named this presentation after that uh, paper. Um, the, uh, if you want to ask a question, well, what did Tim learn uh, as a fellow at Stanford University? The answer is, I learned that governance, that is how you make decisions rather than the decisions themselves is the most important decision you'll make when you're trying to advance new policies, whether it's a controversial new policy to improve things in rivers or whether it's to build a project. Uh, uh, governance is the, the, a keystone of success, but we don't think about it very much. Uh, and I'm, I, frankly, I'm trying to change that a lot. When we do, when, when I have thought about it, looking at my career, I will tell you collaboration works and conflict doesn't. Um, now, I'm throwing a bunch of assertions at you here. First, that governance is a terribly important decision. The second is we don't think about it. And the third is that collaboration is the best form of governance. So I don't ex ex accept, expect you uh, to agree with those on face value. Let me, exp let me share with you why I have come to that very strong position fairly late in my career. Um, let's start at the beginning. What, what is governance? Uh, any public policy has to answer three basic questions. Who gets what and when? Who date? Who just? Who makes that decision? And what decision making process uh, are they going to use to make those decisions? In California water policy, these questions have been answered in very different ways over time. I'm, a, I'm about to rely some on uh, a book I would recommend to you all uh, by uh, Adela Schleger and Bill uh, Blomquist, published in 1978. Changed my professional views when I read it. The book is called Embracing Watershed Politics. It was a title I couldn't resist and I devoured the book uh, and wound up being a very good friend with, uh, with Bill Bloomquist. Um, I called him to answer, ask questions a hundred times. Uh, the, uh, another thing that Bloom, Schlager and Bloomquist emphasize is that natural resource or watershed decision-making, it, it evolves through decision-making errors, through different errors. And I think that their, their three era model really fits California water well. The first era is the development era. That's when you build all that really big infrastructure. Uh, that's Governor Pat Brown in 1963, uh, starting the construction of Oroville uh, Dam near the city of Oroville, uh, California. Uh, in this period, the focus is almost entirely on building infrastructure for low cost water for a growing economy. That has a lot of uh, collateral damage to it, especially for the environment and also for mar other marginalized groups. Uh, and that led to the second era, the regulatory era, uh, where we tried to unwind some of that damage uh, and, uh, and work, work to protect and restore our environment. Uh, Schlager and, and Bloomquist, though they argue strongly that to really get to good natural resource policies, you need to enter a collaborative era. And in California, that's, uh, we, 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 I, in my career, I was doing collaborative things back in the 1980s, uh, uh, but where I think I would argue we're still trying to break through into a collaborative era in California water policy. What I really want you to pay attention to with these eras though, is how the decision-making processes changed. Um, the, in the first two eras, the development era and the regulatory era, the decision-making was top-down, managerial and adverse, adversarial. Those are phrases from the public uh, political science literature. Uh, in, the, in the development era, it was the state of California, the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, the uh, 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 East Bay Municipal Utility District, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, uh, the city of Los Angeles with their Owens Valley project. Those were all big thinking projects of the development era, which were driven by engineers and the, and the uh, lawyers that they surrounded themselves with. Every one of those projects had fierce opposition. Uh, and did, uh, you may not be aware that the governor of Arizona called out the Arizona National Guard uh, in the early 1930s to go to Parker, Arizona to try and stop the, uh, the construction of the Colorado River Aqueduct that would take water into Southern California. He failed. They tried to use dynamite in the Owens Valley. They failed. Uh, John Muir was, was destroyed by uh, the San Francisco project. So there was always opposition, but the rules of the game were structured so the developer had his way. He would, he would roll over any opposition, that they would roll over any opposition that they chose uh, and uh, then when we got into the, I find this very interesting, by the way, when we got into the regulatory era, the goals of public policy certainly changed from developing water supply to protecting the environment. 
but the decision-making process did not. It was still top-down, it was still managerial, it was still adversarial. The only difference was there was no longer water agencies that were making those decisions. It was regular, powerful regulatory agencies making those decisions. And once again, you know, like within the water business my entire career, you often felt like you were being rolled over by uh, in, environmental decision makers the same way uh, that others felt they were being rolled over by your organizations in previous decades. To go to a truly collaborative era, you have to change your governance model. Uh, you need a, a governance, a, a collaborative governance system has multiple players at the table. They all need to have equal weight. They're going to be considering be considering very much more complicated uh, solution sets for policy problems. That none of that can be dictated from the top down. It has to be built from the bottom up, uh, and that's a, a huge change that it will take California quite a quite a while to adjust to. I think we're in the process of that, uh, but I do want to emphasize how much decision-making changes when you move from the two earlier eras into the, into the third era. Um, uh, in whatever area you're talking about, a very important thing to remember is in our democracy, policymaking about something that's controversial or water, that's the top center, or health, that's the top left, it is very participative. Uh, the legislatures and, and administrators, of course, make important decisions, but they are always surrounded by, a, by uh, a, hundreds, even thousands of separate interest, interest groups that are seeking to influence legislation one way or another. According to Schlager and Bloomquist, uh, in managing natural resources, you can't escape politics. A lot of people want to escape politics. They think politics taints the decision-making process. I do not share that view. In a democracy, our public policy is forged through a political process, like it or not. Uh, I don't think it, you really think about it. You would want to change that. This is a direct quote from Schlager and Bloomquist. For people to govern watersheds well requires that they make collective choices. Collective choices are ultimately political choices. Thus, governing watersheds well requires embracing politics. Uh, that's why the book really stuck with me. This is something I realized as, in my 20s when I was starting to write my PhD dissertation. Um, and uh, to deal with that, I'm an economist, by the way, by training. I don't think uh, that Kiko mentioned that. Uh, so I think in, in terms of market dynamics, and when I wrote a PhD dissertation 40 years ago, uh, even more than that now, uh, I, on, on how technical issues and political issues come together, I hypothesized that there were really two types of markets out there. One was private markets, which I was very familiar with analyzing as a graduate student in e economics. In private markets, decisions are made by decentralized entities guided by Adam Smith's famous uh, 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 invisible hand. Those decisions determine the price output and consumption of goods and services in our economy. And it, this is an interesting contrast. Uh, in a private market, collaboration is undesirable. Any economics professor will tell you that collaboration leads to collusion, which leads to inefficiency, and it's bad. Uh, I also felt then, and I feel now, 40 years later, that you can apply market dynamics in thinking about how the political system works. Uh, in the political market, Decisions are made by centralized public entities, not by decentralized folks, with con but with considerable stakeholder participation. Uh, uh, those decisions determine the rules of the game. Uh, they don't produce goods and services, but they produce things that are arguably more important. To influence decisions, and I did this hundreds of times in my career, uh, stakeholders compete by building coalitions. You want partners to work the legislature, to work the administrative branches. Um, and I came to realize fairly early in my career that collaboration is essential to secure sound policy outcomes. Um, uh, but then I want to, the fact, although the fact is I had seen coalitions in the political world do good things and bad things. And when I was at Stanford thinking through that dilemma, it occurred to me uh, that uh, the, the, I'm going to go buy that one. It occurred to me that uh, coalition building is universal in the political marketplace, but there are very different kinds of coalitions out there. Warrior coalitions, they, 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 they go through winner-take-all uh, processes uh, to try and uh, beat their enemy. You, you grow your silo. We all live in silos. I've all lived in silos at one time or another uh, to, to be as big as possible so you can go out and destroy the other silos and get what you want in public policy. It is, that's, most of you will recognize that as Muhammad Ali. I want to say up front, nobody is a greater admirer of Muhammad Ali than Tim Quinn. But the fact is he was in a warrior profession. 
And his goal as a warrior was to put his adversary, in this case, Sonny Liston, 1964, I think, uh, on the map. The second kind of coalition is a collaborative coalition. Uh, in a co collaborative coalition, people have to leave their silos uh, and work outside the silo, get others to do the same, make, heaven forbid, compromises uh, that create collaborative shared benefits. And every time you make a big compromise, I guarantee you, you are angering somebody back in your silo. Uh, and frankly, these, I, I don't think I'm fooling anybody. These images show, does Tim prefer collaboration or, uh, or warriors? I prefer collaboration, even though I learned through hard knocks experience, collaboration is really hard. Um, stakeholders have to leave the safety of their silo. When you're in your silo, you're with people who think just like you, you say the same dumb things you've been saying for decades. You throw, you, you launch a missile out of your silo at the other silos every once in a while. You don't get anything done, but your job is safe. Um, uh, if you're uh, in a collaborative process, you have left that, the safety of that silo. And usually you have to go through a, a, a decentralized, inclusive, open and transparent process in a big tent. First time I showed this, uh, image to my students at Stanford. They said, isn't that a circus tent? And I said, yes. And if you're ever involved in a big tent collaboration, you will feel like you're in a circus once in a while. Um, and the, uh, I, I love the, the, the next picture on the right, right bottom. That picture I found on the internet, it was called Angry Man at Public Meeting. Uh, and if you're doing collaboration, you have to be prepared to deal with people who disagree with you, sometimes very emotionally so. And you have to listen to them with empathy and figure out how you can learn from what they're saying. And that's not an easy thing to do. <clears throat> Third, in the development era, your policy goals were pretty straightforward. I wanna build Oroville Dam or the State Water Project. I wanna regulate this fish in this river. Uh, you have very confined policy objectives that are under consideration in, in the political arena. In the, in the, in the uh, collaborative era, you're gonna have to embrace multiple goals. It can't just work for the environment, for the economy, or for social goals. They all have to count, and they all have to count at the same time, simultaneously. And that is an enormously complicated and difficult thing to do well. Uh, last, a related point is in a collaboration, you often, I like, this, I like this phraseology, you often have to grow the problem to solve it. This was a lesson taught to me by an extremely capable facilitator about 25 years ago, when, when the, the dispute, the disputers wanted to focus just on what they were, were, were arguing about, but the, the, uh, but, but the facilitator knew if you did that, you just have winners and losers. So he convinced us to solve more problems than the one that had brought us to the table. And that's certainly true in my career. In the San Joaquin Valley, I'll talk about that in a minute. You can't solve the groundwater problem alone. You can't solve the drinking water problem alone in isolation, and you can't solve the environmental restoration problem alone. You have to combine all of these in an integrated, interrelated package, which is complicated and hard. For all of these reasons, I have always told my staff, war is easy, collaboration is hell. As I said before, in war, all you have to do is keep saying the same dumb stuff you've said forever. In collaboration, you have to take real risks to make good policy happen. And it's, it's hard, but it's also the only real way to make substantive prog progress uh, on something as complicated as California water issues. Uh, despite the difficulties, I'm gonna give you just a few examples, one or two sentences a piece. We have a long list of collaborative success stories in California. At the state level, one of the first things I was involved with, this picture was taken in 1991 on the steps of the California Capitol. Uh, that's Doug Wheeler and Sonny McPeak uh, who are celebrating the 1991 Best Management Practices Agreement for Urban Water Conservation. I'm not going to go into any details. The most important thing, this was uh, this was started as a deeply adversarial process in the State Water Resource Control Board, wind up with environmentalists and urban water managers working through the same process, talking to each other, listening to other, each other. And the main thing that happened there was conservation and local resource development became job number one for urban water managers. And it's still job number one for urban water managers. It's not the only job, but it's a critically important job. And this was a few years later, probably the biggest collaboration I was ever a part of. It's called the Bay Delta Accord. Don't expect you to know much about it. It was 25 years ago. Uh, this picture was taken December 4th, uh, 15th 1994, I was standing, a much younger man, uh, next to the person taking the, uh, the photograph. I had worked my tail off on this, as did everybody up on that stage. And what I want you to notice about this picture, <clears throat> that's Governor Pete Wilson, and behind him, Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt, who became a good friend of mine. 
And there are a, a smattering of, of high level state and federal government officials, but that stage is mostly crowded with a diverse group of stakeholders who really had helped shape that policy and were buying into that policy and supported it. It lasted for about 10 years, but the Delta is a hard place to make things stand up, stand up for a longer period of time. But I will tell you the most success we've ever had in the Delta was back in the 90s when we were doing things collaboratively instead of continually going to war with each other. Um, interestingly, legislatures are places where you can go to war or they're places where you can collaborate. And I did a lot of collaboration as the head of ACWA. Uh, uh, for example, the 2009 Delta Reform Act, which I still don't think has been applied as it should be. It was a real breakthrough historic piece of legislation in my view. Uh, Sigma, where I put my job on the line, uh, and Sigma may seem like very controversial, but it was actually a very, very collaborative process uh, involving even people whose, whose, whose organizations wound up opposing it. Uh, and then I also want to cite uh, to 2014 Proposition 1, which we're still working on spending that, uh, all that money, but it was $7 billion for collaborative uh, projects in the world of California water. I could give you, I don't know, 100 examples of successful collaboration at the local level. I'm going to settle on two that are in, in, in the backyard of most of you. Uh, one is the Butte Creek Salmon Restoration Project, and the other is the Yuba River Accord. I was deeply involved in both of these, personally. Um, and the uh, one of the most satisfying things in my career was working up on, on Butte Creek, where they got everybody together, an open process, local environmentalists were engaged, others were engaged. I was, I was still in a, a Southern Californian at the time. I was there because I was willing to invest money, and my organization was willing to invest money into it. But the key thing about the, uh, uh, the Battle Creek Project is they took a very comprehensive view of that, that part of the habitat that, 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 for, for springland salmon that they could control. They couldn't control things in the Sacramento River, but everything upstream on Butte Creek they could, and they wound up restoring 90 miles of, uh, of habitat one way or another. And I just, I love this diagram because it shows returning uh, uh, spring run female salmon uh, spawners before the project. It's all those little tiny orange bars. And it shows what happened to returning spawning females after the project was implemented. It just exploded. Collaboration works and comprehensive solutions work. Yuba River Accord, less detail for you. Uh, I was involved there largely because uh, the, the uh, the, what's now the Uber Water Agency was putting together a very comprehensive program, and they looked at the sale of water to people south of the Delta as a way to finance some of those good projects that could happen up in uh, in, U in Yuba County. And I represented the Metropolitan Water District, and we bought some of that water. Um, let me turn my attention now to the San Joaquin Valley, where I'm spending a lot of my time these days. Uh, that paper that I mentioned, it got a lot of traction, a lot of readership in the San Joaquin Valley. I had worked in the Valley much of my career, I had relationships throughout the San Joaquin Valley and the Sacramento Valley. My phone rang one day and it was a, a, a very important water leader from that region who said he'd read that paper and that he, uh, that he, he wondered if I could help them move into a more collaborative approach to what they're doing in the San Joaquin Valley. I told him I was very skeptical because the Valley is so well known for uh, uh, going to court with each other, for, uh, you know, for, for stealth legislative tactics, generally for fighting instead of cooperating. I wasn't sure they were ready for it, but I discovered I was wrong. And the reason that collaboration is taking off in the San Joaquin Valley is you have water leaders from every sector who are more interested in getting along with each other and working together and compromising and taking risks than they are in continuing the fight they've been fighting for the last more decades than, than they can count. That's true amongst water agency managers, it's true amongst farmers and the agricultural industry. It's true amongst environmentalists. We have 10 environmentalists engaged in this process. And it's true amongst a variety of local leaders, including uh, counties, cities, uh, uh, community-based organizations that are focused on safe drinking water and academic institutions, but like Fresno State University. And what, we, what I found is we were gathering together a very talented group of people who really wanted to find ways to work together. They really did not trust each other a year ago. And one of the first things you have to do is build trust. And we've been working on that ever since. Um, the result wound up being the San Joaquin Valley Collaborative Action Program. I will refer, refer to it as CAP, which is less of a mouthful. Um, it, it, it was initiated by representatives of Fresno State, Stanford, and stakeholders. I was the Stanford hat uh, in, in those discussions. Uh, the initial step we decided was to have Stanford do what they call an uncommon dialogue on the Valley water issue on September 21st of 2020. 
the goal of the of the, of the uncommon dialogue was to see if there was sufficient interest in the valley to, to put some resources and effort uh, into uh, a large scale collaborative to try and fo uh, focus on new approaches to policy. That that session was co chaired by Buzz Thompson, a very good friend of mine. He's an eminent water uh, authority and a law professor at Stanford University. And Ashley Swearingen, a former two-time uh, mayor of uh, Fresno, uh, California, a Valley thought leader, and she's currently the CEO of the Central Valley Community Foundation. We had more than 50 people that day in a Zoom, uh, and we weren't sure how it would work out. None of us had much practice with, with big Zooms. But I was stunned, frankly. Everybody had something to say. Virtually all of them had something constructive to say. And they decided, by God, they did want to try and do a collaborative effort together. And that's what started the, 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 the camp. We're now in a stage where we've just come out um, with some products, which I'll describe in a minute. But I, what I want you to remember about those products is that they are supported by five caucuses, which we have, we have structured ourselves in the five caucuses ever since that first Uncommon Dialogue. First caucus is the Safe Drinking Water and Disadvantaged Community Advocates Caucus. The second caucus are environmental NGOs. The third are local government, mostly cities and counties. I'd like to grow that caucus, by the way. Um, the fourth is Farmers in the Ag Industry, which is our biggest caucus, by the way, more than 20 members uh, in that caucus. And last but certainly not least is water agencies from throughout the San Joaquin Valley. These are groups that were not used to working together. Uh, they were former adversaries, so we had a real challenge in getting them to work together. But I think myself and the, the, what, I call, what I call the management team, uh, we did a pretty good job of getting them to, to build relationships and, and come up with some solutions themselves. I'm gonna just briefly describe uh, a, a framework agreement that they came to in December. Uh, implementation of the CAP Action Planner Framework will bring historic change to water resource management in the Valley. I mean, this, this is like nothing that's ever happened since they built uh, the original projects. And it, it may be more important than that. If you ask me, the CAP Action Plan will uh, assure rapid action to provide universal access to safe, reliable, affordable drinking water. They couldn't do that without a broad coalition pushing for the money and the policies that they need. They now have, those advocates now have that. Uh, eliminate the demands of the supply gap, which is humongous in the San Joaquin Valley. They've been over pumping their groundwater basin for decades. Uh, uh, we're going to eliminate the demand supply gap and the, everybody is committed to ending long-term over, overdraft once and for all. That era is behind the San Joaquin Valley and they're going to do it. This is a really important phrase with equal efforts to reduce demand and increase supply. Uh, and if you know anything about water, you know there was some huge give and take. Uh, to be able to put that on a slide describing what they had agreed to. Uh, we're going to create one of the largest ecosystem restoration programs in the country. That's largely because demand reduction will happen through uh, what's called land repurposing, where you take land off of irrigation, but you don't want to just leave it idle where it's a nuisance to somebody. You want to repurpose it to some high, other high value activities. And there are half a dozen of them. To me, the most important one is to repurpose towards ecosystem restoration. So this creates a huge opportunity for ecosystem restoration, which will have broad support in the ag community, we hope, uh, uh, as, as opposed to broad opposition. Uh, we're initiating a valley-wide effort to coordinate changes in how land is used to accomplish multiple benefits. All of our goals require substantial changes in how land is used. We have water unsustainability, we have land use unsustainability in the valley, and we have to tackle them both at the same time. And then lastly, we, we are very determined to align local, state, and federal water policies and funding with an emphasis on providing resources for local government. The local governments down there feel pretty beaten down. Uh, they get unfunded mandates handed to them left and right. They don't have the staff. They don't have the resources. And there's such an important part of solutions that we need to fix that as a, as a key element of moving forward. And altogether, in the action plan and the framework, there are more than 90 actions to transform the valley from uns sustainable to sustainable water resources management. Uh, I am uh, pretty jazzed about this. Uh, CAP was designed and it, it was successful because it was designed on principles for a successful coalition, facilitative leadership, bottom up, not top down. Uh, we have very engaged stakeholders, which has not been the case in California water since the 1990s. And we have a, a diverse variety of engaged stakeholders who have built they're not 100% there, but I'd say they're 78% there, uh, where they were at 10% when we started a year ago. Uh, but it's amazing what honest give and take at a negotiating table will do to build relationships of trust. 
Uh, the process has been open and transparent. It's going to open up even more now that we can't hide in, in, uh, uh, from, from, from what we're proposing. Uh, it has been the definition of a big tent that we, we, our main decision-making body is that we call it the plenary group. It has start, started with the 50 people that participated in the Uncommon Dialogue in September of 2020. There are now 75 people. It's grown a lot as interest in this process has grown in the San Joaquin Valley. And finally, everyone is committed to growing the problem so that they can solve it. Uh, the farmers have come to realize they can't solve their water problem by running over other interests in, in, in an isolated policy. The same thing is true for drinking water. They don't have hardly any opposition. Nobody disagrees with what they're doing, but yet they haven't been able to do it alone. They need partnerships with others. And the environmentalists, same, same way, we can't solve any of these problems in a standalone, isolated fashion. We have to integrate them together in a plan like the phase one action plan. And that is what we have done. So is California entering that collaborative era of water policy? If you read, if you read my paper, you'll, you'll, you'll probably discern that in 2019, I was not at all sure that that was the case. And the answer is, it depends on us. Uh, do we want everyone listening to this and who will listen to it uh, in video format? Do you want to be warriors and continue the fight to win everything for your side and, and vanquish the evil guys on the other side? Or do you want to be collaborators and compromise for comprehensive and durable policy solutions? I know what I choose. Uh, and you, every Californian involved in water has to decide what they want to choose. And that's my shtick. Um, uh, comments and questions, but not now. So... Um, Kiko, I need to stop sharing, right? I'm going to stop sharing. Yes, stop sharing. And um, at this time, we'll turn it over to Brian to share his screen and begin his presentation. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Tim. That was really great. I think um, I'm going to repeat some of the messages that you had on how to do good collaborative water policy. Um, my name is Brian Graber, and I, <clears throat> I remove dams for a living. And I want to thank Circle for giving me the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject uh, tonight. So I'm the senior director, the national director of the restoration program at American Rivers. Uh, we're a national nonprofit. We're dedicated to protecting and restoring rivers. I've worked on dam removal projects and advocacy for the past 22 years. My team and I around the country, we've collectively worked on probably more than 250 dam removal projects. Uh, and we've also trained hundreds of professionals, maybe thousands of professionals over those years to, to manage dam removal projects also. And as we look here at the, uh, an, an overhead image of the Columbia Mill dam removal, this was removed from the Pollens Kill in New Jersey a few years ago. Um, I am based in, the South Yuba watershed, but I do work nationally. So I'm gonna do a little scaling here of talking about uh, how fundamental collaboration is to removing dams around the country, and then about how we're planning to apply some of the lessons we learned to California dam removals. And then I'll talk about a national effort that we've been working on the past couple of years to advocate for national dam removal policy. All right, so, why do we care about dams and why do we care about dam removal? Well, number one, for us, a conservation organization, there really is no faster or effective way to bring rivers back to life than removing a dam. And we've seen this all over the country from sturgeon restoration in Maine, herring up and down the East Coast, mussel recovery in North Carolina, smallmouth bass in the Midwest, places like Wisconsin, uh, and of course, Pacific salmon uh, up and down the West Coast. And it's not just habitat, that comes back to life, but also water quality improvements, like we've seen on the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, the river that famously was lit on fire in the 1960s. Uh, we've really improved water quality there through removing dams. Um, but also recreationally, uh, boating on the Penobscot River in Maine after the, the VZ dam removal a few years ago, um, that river, the Penobscot, now holds a um, whitewater championship. Um, we've also seen economic development from uh, in places like Wisconsin with canoe trails, like on the Kickapoo River, uh, where they now have millions of dollars of tourism um, in a rural economy uh, resulting from dam removal projects. But perhaps even more importantly, as we look on the left there at the Oroville Dam spillway failure from a few years ago, 
uh, from the Feather River watershed. Um, dams are aging in the US and dam failures are occurring with far too much frequency. Dam removals are a permanent way to manage dams that have become unsafe. And so here's my little cartoon on the ecological impacts of dams. So here we start off with our, our free flowing river. Free flowing rivers support a diversity of life. This is the best I could do with PowerPoint. This is supposed to represent a diversity of life. Um, we put a dam on that system, on that river, and immediately we cut off those species, those fish and other species from being able to move. And movement is critical to the life history of the majority of species that live in rivers, um, not just throughout the years, but also within a particular year for seasonal refuge, finding new food sources, uh, refuge from floods and droughts. So hence the term. Now water that sits impounded behind dams, especially in the summer sun, warms up. As water warms up, that has direct impacts on many species, but also warmer water means lower dissolved oxygen in that water. It's an indirect relationship. Higher temperature, lower dissolved oxygen. So this guy's complaining about it being hot. Dams also are really good at trapping sediment, the debris that moves, the soil and other debris that moves from upstream. Um, along with that sediment comes nutrients. Along with those nutrients and sediment means that uh, impoundments, the reservoirs created by dams are more shallow environments. So along with that warm water, that nutrient, um, those nutrients help with vegetation growth, algal growth, that uh, respiration of that vegetation and the decay of things like algae also reduce dissolved oxygen in the water. So there's an additional feedback loop on oxygen uh, resulting from impounded water. This is particularly acute in places like the Klamath River, where we're working on removing four dams in Northern California and Southern Oregon, um, where the water temperature and algae problem is so bad that, that they have um, cyanobacteria blooms that uh, wipe out life in the impoundments and are toxic to even small animals going into um, those areas. And then the habitat created by dams is friendlier habitat to non-native species. So this is meant to, for example, represent Asian carp in the Mississippi River uh, that readily make use of dam impoundments. And so those guys really like this setup. So all of the things that we think about uh, that make up river health, and there, there are basically four aspects to river health. It's uh, the flow regime, having a natural flow regime, uh, having um, water quality, having connectivity of habitat, and having complexity of habitat. All of those things are impacted by dams. And while we would like to prioritize dam removals based on those ecological benefits first, in actual practice, dams are removed where dam safety is enforced. And safety issues with dams are significant and they're growing. And you can see a couple of data points here. Um, there are a lot of dam failures each year. Uh, floods cause dam failures around the country. Um, and we've seen many recent cases. I showed a, a picture of the Oroville Dam spillway failure, but there have been many other cases, including loss of life from dam failures uh, in recent years. Um, the Stanford National Performance of Dams Program uh, has shown from the data that since 1980, an average of 24 dams have failed each year around the country. The Brigham Young University has also tracked drownings at lowhead dams. Lowhead dams, um, or dams where the water flows over the spillway all the time. It creates hydraulics downstream that can trap people. Um, and dams are um, attractive places to play on and around. And so BYU has tracked 555 drownings at lowhead dams. That number is probably low. So dam safety is a significant issue um, and probably the greatest incentive for why we are able to remove dams. And so we've been removing a lot of dams. Uh, at American Rivers, we gather data on dam removals each year, and uh, you can see the, um, the number of projects that have been completed on this map. 
Uh, you can find this map on our website if you just Google American Rivers Dam Removal Map. Um, and what can you see here? A lot of dam removal is done of old mill dams on the entire East Coast, Eastern half of the country, um, but also a lot of dam removals in California. In fact, um, California has removed 173 dams, uh, according to our records. There's only one state, Pennsylvania, that has removed more. Pennsylvania has removed more than 350. And here's what those numbers look like uh, plotted by year. And uh, this is not a cumulative chart. This is the by year data. Um, you can see a, a tremendous growth in the number of products per year around uh, 1999, starting around 1999 or so. Um, in the past few years, somewhere between 65 and 100 dams are removed each year uh, around the country. And overall, it's, um, we've tracked 1,797 dam removals, and the majority of those, the vast majority of those, since 1999. So are you surprised by these numbers? It's a lot of dam removals. Um, and if you are surprised by these numbers, it's probably because when you think of dams, you think of the dam on the left, which is the Iron Gate Dam on the Klamath River. This, is a, uh, this dam is 173 feet high. Um, and this is typically what people think of when they think of dams. But the vast majority of dams around the country and in California look more like the one on the right, which is a dam that was recently removed from the Cleveland National Forest outside of Los Angeles. Uh, it's one of 81 dams that the National Forest has prioritized for removal, and it's more like a 10-foot high dam. And in fact, the majority of dams, of dam removals, have been of dams less than 25 feet high. Now, these dams are still very significant. If you are a species that can't jump 10 feet, a 10-foot dam might as well be a 200-foot dam. So the Cumulative impacts and the direct impacts of these dams um, are significant. But, and this is where the collaboration comes in, dam removals are often contentious projects. Um, and despite the contention, or maybe because of the contention and the scientific and engineering challenges, removing a dam is impossible without collaboration. So what can you see here? Uh, we have a, uh, billboard um, at a uh, dam removal project in Wisconsin several years ago. It says, take a second to say goodbye to the lake. The mud hole you will see is sponsored by the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin. So why do these people care about losing their dam? Well, because this is a marina uh, that was on this large lake. This is the ward dam removal in Wisconsin. Um, and it's, it makes sense. We're taking away what people have had um, their entire lives, probably living memory of anybody currently living. Um, the dam has been there for that period of time. And so it's understandable that these are contentious projects. And we hear a number of things in public meetings um, very frequently, probably most commonly that uh, people are concerned that uh, they're gonna get flooded out if we take a dam out. In actual practice, only about 15% of dams provide any kind of flood control the vast majority do not. And we typically um, are not removing flood control dams. We're removing the other ones. And then we hear other concerns too about, you know, there's gonna be just mud flats left behind. Uh, it's gonna be wetland loss, habitat loss, um, historic issues, loss of the history of the area, uh, recreational changes. People are concerned about their property values. But what all of this adds up to is that the contention around these projects is usually with the surrounding community. Um, we are usually not in contention, usually, with the dam owners themselves. The dam owners need our help, and that's why we're able to do these projects. And so the fundamental item number one is that you don't have dam removal projects unless you have dam owners willing to take out their dams. And we're looking here at the Searsville Dam, which is a dam owned by Stanford University. Um, in the vast majority of cases, we do not convince dam owners to remove their dams because we are holding protests, because we are drawing lines in the sand, or because we're drawing zippers on dams. Um, that's not what results in dam removals usually. Those approaches have their places, but they usually do not result in completed dam removals. 
So what do we do? We collaborate with dam owners to address their needs. And there are a few incentives for dam owners to take out dams. Most commonly, dam owners have a safety or maintenance issue with a dam that doesn't make them enough money to make repairs worth it. And so they are coming to us looking for help to take their dams out. Um, in some other cases, uh, the cost of remediating environmental issues, and this is common with uh, um, hydropower relicensing. Um, so the cost of doing things like providing fish passage or improving water quality makes dam ownership too expensive. And so that compliance is the ultimate reason for a dam owner wanting to remove their dam. Um, that image on the left is um, from the Klamath, uh, one of the Klamath dams, where you can see that cyanobacteria that accumulates um, upstream of those, dam, of those dams. And um, the cost of, of um, mitigating that water quality issue was just too great for the hydro dam owner here to continue to operate their dams. And so they are removing those four dams on the Klamath, um, mainly because of the expense of remediating this environmental issue. And then in other really limited cases, dams are purchased from dam owners to complete um, either environmental mitigation or uh, in very few cases, uh, we are purchasing dams from dam owners just to remove them. Um, but in all cases, what you're seeing here is that it's the dam owner's choice and their choice is usually based on economics. We're not forcing dam owners to take dams out. And this results in the dam removal equation. Um, dam removals result because usually dam owners have a liability and there are funds available to remove their dams. And those funds are usually for ecological restoration, not for dam safety, not to deal with dam liability, but they're for ecological restoration. And so that collaboration brings us conservation groups together with dam owners to take out dams. All right, so going from the collaboration on individual projects to shifting to statewide collaboration, we've worked with a lot of states around the country to build dam removal programs. Um, and we start off with this question that you see here. Um, we would remove a lot more dams if we did what? And so we break this question down into its component parts or its limiting factors to figure out how we would complete a lot more dam removals in whichever state we're working with. Uh, and we have held workshops to answer this question in approximately 15 states around the country. Um, and we've done that in a collaborative way. And we work together with uh, state and federal agencies and other nonprofits to create a strategic plan for that state. And it's an approach that really works and has led to many more dam removal projects through sustainable state programs. Um, we're soon gonna be hiring staff in California to try to lead an effort like this here um, in California. Um, so we're bringing together state and federal agencies and interested nonprofit groups. And typically we collaborate on a two day workshop to discuss limiting factors like the ones you see here. Um, and so I'll go through some of these. Um, and again, answering the question, uh, we can remove a lot more dams if we do what? And so for example, with these limiting factors, um, if we remove a lot more dams, who's gonna manage those projects and how are we gonna train them? How can we raise a lot more money for dam removal projects, including much needed project management funding? Um, how do we increase owner incentives, so incentives for dam owners, um, such as by strengthening dam safety programs? How can we work with regulators and, and the regulations to create clarity and provide assistance to help people get through the dam removal process? Um, for leadership, how can, we, how can our collaboration provide state level leadership? In many states, we've developed and regularly convened what we call aquatic connectivity teams. And these are interagency and nonprofit teams that work on dam removals. And we are continuing to work to establish more of these aquatic connectivity teams in states around the country. And then finally, how can we just build momentum? Uh, every project makes the next project easier if we learn from each other and we work collaboratively. So that's how we scale at the state level. I'll now talk about one of the ways that we are scaling dam removal at the national level. Uh, for the past three years, we've helped lead a forum called the Uncommon Dialogue. 
this was also a uncommon dialogue developed by Stanford, like the one Tim talked about, but this is a different uncommon dialogue than the one that Tim talked about. Um, <clears throat> our concept here was to bring together the hydropower industry, conservation groups, and dam safety groups like the Association of State Dam Safety Officials and um, the um, Association of, of uh, Civil Engineers, American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, and so we brought together these groups to try to find common ground on what we're calling the three R's of dams. And the, those are removing dams, rehabilitating dams or dam safety, and retrofitting dams for hydropower. And this national collaboration has been, uh, for the last year, nearly 100% of my work. Um, and it has also been probably the most difficult thing that I've worked on in my career, um, but also one of the most rewarding things that I've worked on in my career. And this document that I'm showing here um, shows the joint statement that we issued from the Uncommon Dialogue in October of 2020, um, after two years of negotiating every single piece of the language that is in this uh, multi-page document. And there's a reason why I'm starting to present the Uncommon Dialogue to you by showing this boring document that has no logo. And I will get to that reason in a moment. But that leads to my collaboration lessons learned. So I'm sort of going to give you the conclusion here before I show you some of the things that we've accomplished with the Uncommon Dialogue. Um, so some of those lessons are, number one, collaboration between disparate groups that have been at odds in the past, like the hydropower industry and conservation groups, is difficult. Um, it has been difficult over the, the last years that we've been doing this. You need to keep sitting down again and again and identify where you agree again and again and show why you're not threatening to each other. Um, if you do that, the collaboration can be extremely productive. And we've had some productive outcomes from this. Um, another key lesson that we learned the hard way is that no one in the collaboration should try to represent everyone else. You need to set ground rules for this at the outset. We had a challenge with this early on with press interviews leading the stories that the Uncommon Dialogue states that hydropower is the solution to climate change. Um, this led many of our partners to get very frustrated with American Rivers for saying that hydropower is the solution to climate change. We didn't say it, but we are a member of the Uncommon Dialogue. Um, and as a result, we agreed that the Uncommon Dialogue is not an entity. It does not have a logo. It is, not, it is only a forum for us to get together. It is simply a place for us to gather and discuss common ground from which each group that's involved can choose to agree on our product, on the products that we produce, or can choose not to sign on to a particular product. So any one of those products does not come from the Uncommon Dialogue. It comes from the groups that are agreed on that product. Um, we've also faced a lot of criticism from our partners and even from within our own organization for collaborating with the hydropower industry. Um, we should have done a lot more work early on to discuss what, on what issues we were not willing to compromise with our partners, um, with our own um, organization, and how we would communicate about the collaboration. And then finally, as we've worked together to develop and pass, pass federal legislation, um, the negotiation, negotiating has been challenging. I've realized that every word matters, especially in legislation, especially in federal legislation, every word matters. And so one tactic that, that we've, we've done that I think has worked really well in negotiating is to ask the other side early on, what is most important to you? And so as we negotiated with um, uh, National Hydropower Association and American Rivers, we led the negotiation on the dam removal items that are in the legislation that we worked on. Um, and when I asked that question, what is most important to you with uh, the hydro industry, they said two things. One, um, one of the most important things to the members is that dam removal projects should only be done with dam owner consent. So what did I say earlier was a number one issue for dam removals. It's that you only have a project if you have a dam owner on board. So no problem. I can agree to that. We got that one. Products are only done with dam owner consent. The number two issue was that um, they did not want us to promote the removal through the Uncommon Dialogue of any federally owned hydropower dam. All right, that one's a little trickier, but when you do the math, it's really not that hard. 
the federal government owns thousands of dams, but it amounts to about 4% of the dams that are out there. In addition, only about 3% of the dams that are out there produce hydropower. So you take those numbers together and we're not talking about a lot of dams. We can live with that. We can live with not pushing through this forum to remove federal hydropower dams. So early on, we recognized that I can hit the hydro industry's most important items in the negotiation, and I can even help them advocate for those items through our negotiation. I won't say it was easy from there, but um, it was much easier. So, so far, our collaboration has resulted in two pieces of legislation. Uh, the first is the 21st Century Dams Act. Um, this is a, a bill that was introduced in both the House and the Senate in July last year. Uh, we negotiated the language for this bill with, within our forum and then together advocated with our champions. The champions were Senator Feinstein of California and Congresswoman Custer of New Hampshire. And there were many other co-signers to the bill in both the House and the Senate. Um, so this bill includes what we feel is necessary to really make a significant impact on dam safety, dam removal, and hydro re retrofitting in the country. Um, so it includes $17 billion for dam safety, $4.7 billion for tax credits, uh, mostly for um, environmental improvements of hydro dams, $7.5 billion for dam removals, and $11 billion for federal agencies to repair, remove, or retrofit their dams. So what a major accomplishment to have legislation introduced where the hydropower industry supports $7.5 billion for removing dams. I, just, I think this is just an unbelievable accomplishment. And this would not have happened without the collaboration. We would never have gotten a bill passed asking for $7.5 billion for dam removals on our own. In fact, most of the legislators that signed on to these bills were most interested in dam safety not in hydropower, not in dam removal. Um, so this bill has not been voted on. It's unlikely to be voted on. It has been introduced. Um, but we are working with the support of the co-signers in both the Senate and the House to carve off pieces of this legislation uh, to try to pass in other legislation. And one of those is the, um, the second piece which, of legislation which did get passed, is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, so this is the infrastructure bill that was recently passed. That bill includes $1.6 billion for dam removal and dam safety programs. Um, these funds were championed by a Republican Senator, Senator Rob Portman of Ohio. And there is no way that we would have had a Republican Senator support a huge expenditure on environmental issues without our collaboration, without collaborating with the hydropower industry and the dam safety folks. And so the, the image there on the left is the, it's the Schufer Dam Removal. This is a dam removed in uh, 2016 uh, from the Henry Fork River in North Carolina. We have uh, dam removal included in the infrastructure bill in a number of places that I'm showing here. Um, all of these funds are gonna be distributed by the agencies shown here, primarily through grants um, to either dam owners or entities like us who are working with dam owners. All projects are gonna be done with dam owner consent. Um, these are all existing programs and each agency has different priorities for how they're gonna distribute these funds. Uh, for example, NOAA provides funds for projects that benefit migratory fish species. FEMA provides funds for uh, dam safety related projects for, to remove um, high hazard potential dams. So all in all, we see these funds as an enormous victory for river ecology, for dam safety, um, but we also see it as a down payment. Our real ask is from the 21st Century Dams Act. Um, that's the true need that we see, and that's about 10 times the amounts that are in here. Um, and so we're hoping to carve off a different additional pieces from the 21st Century Dams Act. Um, and we're now advocating through the Water Resources Development Act which is a bill that governs the Army Corps activities. Through that act, we're trying to develop an interagency and stakeholder dam removal council at the federal level to help agencies collaborate um, and do things like uh, make the regulatory process more predictable. We're also advocating for funding in the Build Back Better, the Reconciliation Act, um, if that ever gets off the ground.
All right, so thank you all. Um, if you are interested, please check out our dam removal resources on our website. Um, it's easiest to Google those resources. Um, and I'll end with just saying that removing dams is my favorite topic to talk about, and I'm happy to hear your thoughts and answer your questions um, after uh, Keiko introduces it. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, just to reiterate, um, thank you so much, Brian. And uh, I just want to express profound gratitude to Brian and Tim for taking time to be with us here tonight, for prepping these excellent presentations, and for their flexibility as we moved to virtual and rescheduled several times. So um, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, before we open it up for question and answer, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, the Wild and Scenic Film Festival is an annual fundraiser for Circle's work to protect and restore the Uber River. Uh, the virtual film festival runs through January 23rd, and we invite you to explore more of our film and workshop programming online at wildandscenicfilmfestival.org. Our team has curated over 100 films on a variety of environmental topics. In fact, there is a genre titled Water and River Issues with 12 films that might be of particular interest to this group. Um, and once again, we're so excited to have a live audience here with us asking thought-provoking questions. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to just drop them in the chat um, and I will um, share them with the presenters. Thank you everyone for being here. Okay, so we already have questions rolling in. Um, okay, first question from Serena McLean. How do you factor in things like attrition, changes in elected positions, et cetera, into longer term collaboration? Can I jump in? Yeah, the, go ahead. Tom. The short answer, Serena, is maintain your coalition. Uh, and as you have people drop out, make, make sure you're recruiting other people to replace them. Maintain the breadth of that coalition so that when a new elected official uh, comes in and tries to politicize what you're doing, you're in a much, much better position to stop them. Not 100% guarantee, uh, but maintain that coalition through changes in presidents, changes in governors, changes in key congressional or uh, California legislature votes is make sure that when the new person comes in, you can take that group of previous adversaries who are working together in to sit down with them. It almost always has some positive influence on it. <clears throat> Because the last thing you want to have happen is for your projects to be politicized, which I would be interested in Brian's view of this. You know, I, I was never involved in the climate projects, but I had good, good friends who were. And 10, 10 15 years ago, I thought what was happening up in, on the climate movement was a friggin' miracle of collaboration. And then it got politicized. Uh, you know, I think you could check off all your boxes, but it still got politicized, at least that's my perspective, by a Republican congressman from California. Uh, and, if you have any insights as to how you avoid that, I don't know. Maybe they should have been up there briefing them with their constituents earlier, but um, it was sad to watch that thing fall apart. And here you are, 15 years later, still trying to get those dams removed. So we've had a lot of opposition from uh, various legislators uh, on the climate dam removals. And um, I think that the there are two factors that allowed that, that are allowing that project to happen. Um, number one is the advocacy of the tribes that are along the river. They depend on salmon and the salmon are being destroyed by those dams. Um, and they've done an awful lot of work um, protesting in Washington DC, protesting in Nebraska where Warren Buffett, uh, who is the ultimate owner of the company that owns the Klamath dams. Um, and then uh, Governor Newsom, really played a key role in hearing the tribes and being willing to listen to the tribes and helping uh, negotiate getting those projects through. Um, but the collaboration has been um, challenging. Um, and, and part of that is that, you know, we've had to bring together a lot of different expertise there along with the inspiration provided by the tribes um, to work through things like the federal regulatory process, uh, which has been really tricky for to remove that many dams all at once. More questions. Yeah, so we have another here from <laughs> Peter Burns. He says, you've both had experience with Stanford's uncommon dialogue process as a model of collaborative process. What do each of you think 
are the one or two most important aspects that make the uncommon dialogue process so successful? Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, number one is just the, the willingness to participate uh, and getting the right groups to participate. Um, it has been challenging for us as an organization. Uh, we've taken a leadership role, but it's it's been hard. Uh, we've received a lot of criticism from partner groups for even um, talking to the hydropower industry in the first place. Uh, and, and that's it's been challenging. Um, it's longtime partners. Uh, I've, I've heard from one of our partners, for example, about a year ago who told me he was disgusted by our participation in this process. But us continuing to show up, um, not yield ground on places where we cannot yield ground, but also um, uh, compromise. So figure out what's most important to the other parties and, and support those things as hard as we can. So for example, um, there was a period of time where uh, some of the hydropower pieces of the legislation got split off and were moving alone through um, the congressional process. Our staff, our government relations staff, actively advocated for a hydropower bill that was providing tax credits for hydropower. Um, that was a leap for us, but we agreed through this forum that we're all working together and that each one of us is going to support the things that we agree on. So the hydropower industry is supporting dam removal, and we are supporting their tax credits. Um, and and um, I think that's that's one of the biggest keys. In the case of the cap. The Uncommon Dialogue was an extraordinary success. I was really impressed with it. And I, I had participated in Stanford on Uncommon Dialogues, I'm going to say a half a dozen times over the years. Uh, so I, I knew they could be effective. Uh, but I, I, one of the key factors is getting the right people uh, to lead the discussion and to mediate. Um, and I think we did a good, did a good job of that, uh, making sure that you get a broad enough set of stakeholders that nobody feels like they're excluded. But I think importantly, uh, Uncommon Dialogue is all you're doing is having a dialogue. Uh, and what we did with the, the cap was we moved that from just having a dialogue to people who are willing to move together to make binding promises to each other about how they were going to uh, help each other solve each other's problems. And I think that's one of the things that has kept cap going over the past year and a half. Uh, that said, in any big collaboration, it tries to fall apart every two or three months. Uh, and you're out there trying, you know, running like crazy to try and make sure it doesn't do that. Um, all, all that year, even so, I think the Stanford Uncommon Dialogue is not necessarily a place to keep things for the long term, but it's in our case, it turned out to be a very good place to get a collaborative ball rolling. Thank you both. Um, next question is from Michael Ross. Any do's and don'ts for big tent collaborations? Don't be impatient. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, you really do have to change the molecules in your body. I worked for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California for 22 years. Please don't hold that against me. That's a much better player than people give it credit for. It was a great place to learn the water business. Uh, but Met's top down. I was, I, at one point I had 2,000 people working for me. And I was used to telling people what it was going to be and then getting them to agree with me. And you just have to get rid of that in a collaborative process. Uh, I, you know, I was a top down development era thinker. Um, and th th so the, the, to me, the, the, the greatest fatal flaw, one of the, one of the big fatal flaws is uh, for a collaborative to be captured by somebody who's got the tunnel they want to build or the reservoir they want to build. And they're going to, that's what it's all about to them. And it can't be. It's got to be, how do you solve a broader set of problems through collaboration that benefits a whole lot of people so much that they want to stay together? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give... I'll give the exact corollary to that, and that's do be patient. Uh, so Tim said, don't be impatient, do be patient. Um, when you're in your fourth hour of negotiation on language in a uh, legislative bill, um, in a meeting that was supposed to last for an hour, and you're still talking about whether you can use the words dam removal or if you have to call it in-stream barrier removal, um, and, <laughs> and you're duking that out, uh, you gotta keep the bigger picture in mind. And just relax. Um, you're going to miss every other meeting that you need to hold. Um, you're working on this right now and recognize its importance. Um, next question is from Willie Whittlesley. You both have been involved in substantial collaboration. 
What are some att attributes an individual can bring to a collaborative group to help ensure success of the collaborative? I think integrity is, is one of the important ones. Um, you know, my individual views on hydropower and the impacts of dams, uh, you know, as I laid out in my presentation, my views are significant on that issue. I think dams are really damaging. But uh, looking toward the greater good, um, as we come to common ground on um, things like supporting particular measures for the hydro industry or um, uh, supporting some of the parameters that they wanted to have, such as uh, needing to have uh, dam owner consent to take dams out. Um, I need to then convey that when I'm having a conversation with a uh, legislative staff office for a, a senator, I need to say, we wanna have language in there that says we need to have dam owner consent for any dam removals so that that gets conveyed, it's in the language, it gets projected back to the hydro industry when they talk to that same legislator. Um, so maintaining that integrity and supporting the things that, um, that uh, you've compromised on, even though it may be hard for you. Willie, this is a really good question. I certainly agree with what uh, Brian just said. Uh, I would add to that, bring an open mind into the process. Uh, <laughs> Uh, vitally important. Again, don't think you already have the answer because if you think you have the answer, you're not going to be a positive factor in that uh, in that collaboration. Um, and um, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, uh, oh, oh, be creative. One of the reasons that I really like collaboration is it's so entrepreneurial. Uh, and by the way, winner winner take all adversarial processes. They are not entrepreneurial. You, you know what your bosses want and that's by God what you're fighting for. But in a collaboration, you get a bunch of people, and I've certainly been watching this in the cap, you get a bunch of people that really want to find solutions. They are ripe for new ideas. So in my PhD dissertation, those many years ago, I argued that a, a good public policy analyst, your job was to be an entrepreneur, uh, was to come up with ideas that you could present to people engaged in the political process. And they would say, I think there's an idea there where we can agree on this thing instead of fighting over it. So, um, <clears throat> and you know, sometimes somebody that's not one of the entrenched interests at the table can really play a vital role by uh, coming up with creative entrepreneurial ideas uh, that, uh, that give a direction where if you go in that direction, you can get the yes. All right, our next question is another from Michael Ross. Is professional outside facilitation a must or not for a collaborative process? I wouldn't necessarily say it's a must, must that every collaboration has to have it. I've been involved in collaborations that did not have a professional facilitator, but when you get to a certain stage of complexity, I wouldn't try it without a world-class uh, facilitator. Uh, three or four times in my career, I knew we were going into a process that was just so fraught with danger uh, that we, you needed somebody who's really good at dealing with that stuff. Uh, and uh, we went through a, nation, a nationwide search for, uh, the, in, in those cases, for the best uh, facilitator we get. In the, in the case of CAP, we have a facilitation team that I happen to have worked with before, but it was a national competition. We had, I think, eight bids which told me that people were interested in what we were doing. And it went to a man named Jim Waldo and his partner, Jim uh, um, uh, Kramer from Washington State. And those two just had, we, we were blown away with their experience uh, of, of working to make sure they understood where everybody was coming from and that everybody felt that they were being engaged and getting previous adversaries to work together. Uh, so if it gets very complicated, I just don't even like to try it without, without, without a facilitator. It costs you some money, uh, but failure does too. This is, a, this is a challenging question for me because I think my instinct and my observation is that um, if the process is going to be contentious at all, you have to have a professional, a really good professional facilitator. Um, <clears throat> that said, we have had um, professional facilitation through our Uncommon Dialogue and it's been really important. At the same time, I think we've accomplished the most in small group meetings where the facilitator has not been present um, because we can just talk. And so we've had uh, um, small group meetings that have been just the National Hydropower Association meeting with me from American Rivers, the Nature Conservancy, Trout Unlimited, and the Low Impact Hydropower Institute. Um, 
And those meetings have been how we've you know, negotiated much of the language in, in the bills that we've had. Um, but I think it's been critical to have the larger groups also with the facilitation at the same time. I agree with that. Thank you both. There's no questions currently in the chat. So while I, if we wait for some more questions from the audience, I have a question. Um, I'm curious how your, your thoughts on how to make progress when interests are in direct in opposition. For example, a dam owner does not want to remove the dam, but certain groups have identified it as ecologically significant or a safety issue. This is a, a, a major challenge for us, Keiko. Um, we, as much as we would like to prioritize projects based on where we see the greatest ecological benefits, um, as, I've, as I've mentioned, we have to have the dam owner on board. And so what we do in those situations is we try to find out from the dam owner what resonates with them the most. Um, and a lot of times, probably most times, um, we don't come to an agreement with a dam owner. It's their private property. Um, and they can do with it what they want. Um, that's the way the, the rules work. And so what we try to do in those situations is um, improve dam safety programs in states so that dam safety is enforced. And if dam safety is enforced, more dam owners are gonna decide to remove their dams, um, things like that. Um, it is <coughs> impossible to do with an individual dam owner that doesn't wanna take their dam on. I, I don't, I'm not gonna to speak to dam removal but I will tell you the magic elixir that I use when you run into this problem, and I run into this problem a lot, it's why I say grow the problem to solve it. Uh, a good example, when we, we, we negotiated, and some of you out there probably don't like what we did, but I still am proud of it, uh, the Monterey Amendments to the State Water Contracts back in the 90s. And when we got our, our mediator there, we told him we want to just focus on, it's Article 18 in the contracts, uh, how you allocate water. And we were fiercely opposed to uh, urban and the ag contractors uh, squaring off against each other, threatening to take each other to, um, uh, to court. And what I learned in that exercise is grow the problem to solve it. So what our facilitator did, he said, don't just focus on that. I can't get you together if you're just focusing on a win-loss like that. Uh, so figure out what does the other side want? What would be valuable to them? How can you get, get creative and, and compromise? In the case of the Monterey Amendments, we wound up looking at, I don't know, a dozen key contract provisions. And by the time we were done, we were rewriting the contracts in a way that really worked well, I would argue for the environment and for uh, the water contractors and everybody wanted it to happen. And we had all backed off of our initial intransient positions. So again, my, my magic elixir is grow the problem to solve it, find something that that person cares about uh, and then fold it into uh, your, uh, fold it into your project. Uh, so that you're doing more than just the project you thought you were beginning with. Excellent. Thank you both. This is a long question. It yeah. is. Here, let me read it out loud for the group. Um, this question is from Heather Lukak. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. How do the collaborations you are currently working on in California relate to SIGMA, California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act? Does SIGMA support or challenge your specific collaborations? For example, Brian, if groundwater extraction is reduced due to SIGMA requirements, will this put more pressure on surface water and encourage more dams? For Tim, for your San Joaquin Valley collaboration, has SIGMA provided the stick, regardless of its limited enforcement, to bring some of the interests to the table and be willing to negotiate slash collaborate? Or please provide broader responses as well regarding connections between your collaborations in California and SIGMA. Go ahead, Brian. I think for my part of this, I'm gonna I'm gonna circumvent the question a little bit and say that um, you know we do uh, there is a lot of pressure on building new dams for water supply. Um, what we are trying to promote though is uh, ways to um, extract water without dams. And so, for example, uh, we just removed a dam a couple of years ago in uh, Bellingham, Washington, Washington State. Um, that was a water supply dam. Um, provided municipal water for uh, the city of Bellingham. And we removed the dam and maintained their water supply without having a dam there through existing technology. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the ways that we're trying to work on this. I think that um, uh, pressure on not extracting groundwater, of course, increases pressure on uh, surface water extraction. Um, 
And that's just, it's a challenge that we're gonna continue to have to face. And one that Circle has done some really great work on um, advocating for and against. This is a great question. Uh, I don't think that we would have a uh, San Joaquin Valley Water Collaborative Action Program without Sigma. Uh, when I was the head of ACMA, and I, I took seven years to get my board of directors who started as adamantly opposed to the state telling their members to do anything. Uh, and by the time we went through a pretty carefully structured education process for the aqua board, which is quite large, uh, they realized why, why, why Sigma was necessary. I frequently tell people in the San Joaquin Valley, Sigma is not your problem. The overdraft is your problem. Uh, and Sigma gives you tools to deal with the real problem. Uh, they don't all necessarily agree with that, but I would point out that looking at your uh, your reference to sigma, sigma as a stick, you can certainly think of it as a stick. And when we were writing the, the when we were writing the legislation, we realized we were creating a stick, um, but we also realized we were creating a strong incentive for collaboration and for sustainability. So, in the, I will tell you that right now, at least amongst the people engaged in CAP, uh, the in, in the accomplishment of Sigma, that is the elimination of the uh, uh, of, of the overdraft in, in compliance with all of the other, make sure you don't have the undesirable outcomes that are defined in the act. The, the guys I'm working with, they're gonna Im implement that act the way it was written. And they're absolutely opposed to any long-term uh, overdraft. They've been leaning on that crutch for 50 years. They wanna throw that crutch away. And they want the, and they want to then fill the hole that that creates with a combination of supply augmentation and demand reduction. And they know that they need a lot of both. Um, so it has transformed from a stick into something of the basis for talking about sustainability without putting your life at risk down in the valley. Um, and that there were times when, when Tim Quinn walked down into the valley and we were hot in Sigma negotiations where they, were look, they looked at me, they looked at a rope and they looked at a nearby tree. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I, I can't tell you how pleased I am that the valley folks have, re have realized Sigma gives them an opportunity to become sustainable. Uh, I always thought that one of the things we did with, was we shifted the local political uh, power <clears throat> in days before Sigma. If you wanted to end the overdraft and reduce pumping, you had all the growers against you and the growers had the political clout. Uh, and and you know, when, when they could kill a local effort for sustainability, what did they do? They kept on pumping, they kept on pumping. Um, but what Sigma created was if you, kill the local efforts to try and create sustainability. It's not keep on pumping, it's hello state water resources control board. And that has completely changed the negotiating dynamic at the local level. And the water managers who by and large really wanted Sigma to pass, so, you know, their, their boards voted no and they raised all sorts of hell. But we had every notable attorney from the San Joaquin Valley and the Central Valley in those negotiating rooms, helping us craft lang language that would help them implement this law that we knew had to be implemented at the local uh, level. So Sigma has become not, not only a, a stimulus for cap happening, it is in fact, uh, uh, they now have done what I had always hoped it would do, turn the, the valley into people that want to seek uh, sustainability instead of taking from the environment. Don't get me wrong, Weston's Water District is still out there. Uh, there are others like that. Uh, but the group that's growing in the center to do things that are sustainable for multiple benefits, meaning for the environment, for agricultural water supply, for drinking water quality, that group is growing every day and the warriors are shrinking every day. That's Tim knocking on wood, hoping it's really true. Great question. Thank you. Just one, one second, everyone. <laughs> You have to deal with Brian's question. Or ignore it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're unmuting our executive director, Melinda Booth. Um, just need to have, have that happen and we'll get that question answered. Um, so just wanna bring our attention to time really quick. We do have one more question pending an answer and nothing else in the chat. I think we might have um, time for Looks like Melinda's unmuted. Okay, so I'll just read that question for the group. We got a question from Brian that says, is Circle interested in taking the lead to advocate for removal of the Daguerre Point Dam? And our executive director, Melinda, is gonna answer. Uh, yes, and I, I can't turn my video on, but if somebody wants to give me permission to do that, I'm happy to share my face. Melinda Booth, executive director here at Circle. 
Brian, thanks for thanks for the question. I'm always thrilled to be put on the spot. And the, the short answer is is sure, yes. And you know, removal of Daguerre Point Dam is something that we have been interested in um, seeing gone and have conversations about and, and are are really starting to engage, I'd say, more um, directly and start to lay some of the groundwork for that. If we are ultimately able to, to get it out, it is going to be a collaborative effort. And I think a lot of the information here tonight is going to be helpful for that process. And we certainly want to do it in a way that maintains water supply and doesn't take away from the value that it's adding, but that adds to the ability for fish to reach uh, more of their spawning ground and, and these threatened and endangered fish to, to be able to have more of their habitat. A lot of our efforts are going into to habitat restoration above Daguerre Point Dam um, with many of our partners, like Yuba Water Agency, who we do collaborate with very successfully on many efforts. Um, so, so yeah, I think Circle's willing to be the lead. And I'll tell you, I, I don't know that you know this, Brian, we're actually working too with one of your colleagues at American Rivers who focuses his work in California, Mike Davis, and are, are, are starting to have more conversations on this topic. So I'll, you heard it here first. I'm very interested to collaborate with you. Yay. Yay. Well, Brian, is there any circumstance under which you would support building a new dam? That is a challenging question for me organizationally, Tim. Um, there are circumstances where we have done that. We're, we're supporting uh, uh, construction of an irrigation dam in the Yakima Basin in central Washington state. Um, as part of a massive plan to deal with water and um, other issues, water policy, including dam removals um, throughout, throughout that entire watershed. So it's which a piece great, of- It was a great collaborative success story up there too. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do want, I want you all, the audience to know, you, this may surprise mm -hmm. you, the Metropolitan Water District guy, I have been, uh, I thought it was a big deal until I saw all those blue bubbles in your uh, slide in California. Um, but I've been involved in removing seven or eight dams in uh, California. Back in the 90s, I was on the team that built Diamond Valley Lake in Southern California. I believe that was a good thing to do. Uh, by the way, the Nature Conservancy supported that project and they got a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, good habitat out of it as uh, to build that partnership. And uh, uh, up, up in well, at the same time, we were up taking four dams off of Butte Creek. We were working on taking dams off of Battle Creek. We, we took a dam out down on uh, Clear Creek. So I think some dams need to go come down. I didn't realize how big the issue was, and I really appreciate Brian's information. Uh, and uh, but we probably want to be aware that, that that dams probably are a part of our future to operate the system for multiple benefits. And you don't have to agree with that. Well, thank you both for your thoughts on that. And again, I wanna thank you both for being here and, and for your time here tonight. Um, it is 6.31, so um, I, I wanted to just be aware of your time and respectful of your time. And um, I think now is probably the time to end the recording and let anybody go who would like to go. Um, but I do wanna invite anyone who would like to stay on maybe for the next five or 10 minutes um, for a sort of meet and greet. Um, and I'll have our... Um, Eric, our, our film festival producer, allow everyone to unmute and turn their video on if they'd like, they'd like to do a meet and greet. And thanks That's everyone good. for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Keiko.